in Virginia. Came down 95 South and you know, the protocol dictates that we gotta stop and salute our comrades on the way. If y'all seeing this and I ain't stopped, that don't mean you're not a comrade. <laughs> but the mission is a must right now and we're here during this Black August. A brother who I met through Black August, the FTP movement doing collaboration up here in Virginia, Brother Manifest. Peace, 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 peace. And very quickly our brotherhood and conversation and this collective work came to that free to land work. The agriculture. Before you know it, he was bringing us up here to share, you know, uh, just that whole sharing of jewels as it relates to growing our own food. So today we've been kind of reasoning a little bit about, really about memory, you know. So, Brother Manifest, just share a couple of vibes with the people. Yeah, man. So, you know, we've been building and talking about food security food sovereignty mm -hmm. you know we've been talking about economics of food as industry and um you know it's a powerful powerful vibration because um you know I'm, I'm i'm i consider myself to be a baby in this work you know as far as farming you know urban farming or what have you but uh the blessing is that it's wide open <clears throat> And when I started doing it, you know, and connecting with my other farmers and my peer com comrades as in the same work, uh, it's like a lightning strike, <laughs> you know, catch fire, mm -hmm. so much opportunity in the space, you know? That's it. And it's, um, you know, for me right now, like, I've done production, you know, I've built traditional outdoor farms, I've built indoor farms, I've built urban orchards, urban vineyards, you know. And so now the task is to grow more growers, you know, because we can build all the infrastructure in the community, mm -hmm. but without <clears throat> without more growers, all of this for naught. Right. So like my, my, you know, my call for my brothers and sisters is watching this video is to learn how to grow, because we can be employing each other, we can be employing our family members through production. So Manifest, let's talk about that for a minute. And I love your name, Brother Manifest. I've always loved that name. But when we say that, that we can employ each other in production, you know, it don't sound like it's Macy's or it's the local fish fry shop that got a steady business or the local strip club or something. It's just for some people, that still seems like such a far stretch. Give us some real clear example okay. of what you mean. Okay, so um, I use an example. I I just came from building a, um, a, a indoor farm in Petersburg, right? Mm -hmm. So the indoor farm we grow hydroponically, aeroponically, aquaponically. You know, fifteen thousand square feet worth of grow space. Mm -hmm. I don't have anybody that knows how to grow food in that environment. So even though I have, you know, the capacity to grow every 30 days, you know, 10,000 uh, pounds of greens, mm -hmm. uh, which is $10,000, you know, every 30 days. Uh, and that's, that's, that's at least $10,000. It's at least. It's uh, at least that's a dollar a pound. It's a dollar a pound. A dollar a pound of greens. Well, most greens are going to go for two or three. Two or three. So it's just low brow. This yeah. low browing. Yeah. Low browing it every 30, 45 days, 10,000 pounds of it in, the, in the indoor environment. So how many months in a year? 12 months mm -hmm. in a year. So every 30 days, I'm doing 10,000. So I'm doing 120,000, mm -hmm. you know a year on the indoor farm. So how many people can I employ at $30,000 a year, you know, doing those type of numbers? I can employ at least four people at $30,000 a year. But because I don't have people that are knowledgeable as far as how to produce, then I can't really quantify it right yet. Right. So that's one example. 
you know, but we do the uh, traditional outdoor space, you know, I might have a lot, a vacant lot that's 20 feet by 150 feet, which is what, uh, 30,000 square feet, mm -hmm. right? So <clears throat> if I plant the entire 30,000 square feet, and give it take some pathways, etc. I say I got 20,000 square feet that I'm growing on. Mm -hmm. um, and I do three season farming, you know, so a dollar a pound, you know, dollar per square foot, a pound per square foot. Mm -hmm. I'm looking at 60,000, you know, dollars off of that lot. Mm -hmm. But do I have somebody that's growing, that can grow to proficiency, that can maximize, mm -hmm. you know, the production on the space? So those are two examples. That's just production. Right. You know, we talk about distribution. You know, my, my organization, we did 4000 We did $4,000 worth of produce in two months, mm -hmm. you know, sales. Mm -hmm. worth of, so that was like a uh, dollar a pound. Mm -hmm. And we're selling produce from farmers, right? So the blessing in that is that, you know, my nonprofit, you know, we made a little money off it. But I had to pay the farmer who did the growing. Of course. So he made the bulk of the money. Of course. So... How do I can how can I put that money back into my community, right? Mm -hmm. So the question is, is like, who's doing the distribution? So if I can pay somebody, you know, I don't know, a dollar off of every pound of vegetables that's that's grown, you know, that's two thousand dollars. That's a thousand dollars a month, mm -hmm. which is a part time job right. for somebody. Yeah. Right. So these are just that's just production Real and talk. distribution. It's not even talking about value added and me packaging it. Right. And then reselling it to the grocery. Or That's just keeping it basic. But what you're saying is it requires a skill. It requires a skill. Absolutely. So, so check this out, though. Um, just for the sake of time, uh, we we want people to, instead of spending a whole lot of time watching this video, receive the obvious inspiration and put their hands in the soil somewhere. But well, we're here in Richmond, Virginia. One of the reasons to be quite transparent is for the people watching that I stopped today is to to be silent for a moment and, and uh, pay homage to some of our African ancestors who are buried here, including Gabriel Prosser, yes. who was hung yes. um, a few blocks from where we are right now. Yes. The African burial ground. Now, you off the camera, you were kind of explaining to me some of the dynamics about that. Yeah. But I want to instead of talking about the dynamics of the politics over the African burial ground and all that, you know, the community in New York faces the same thing. Mm -hmm. And we're finding more and more because we know that those places existed all over the place, really. Yes. They're becoming unearthed and people are, are rising up. But what's interesting to me right now is this whole full circle, you know. We were just talking in the James River of all places. You know, Jamestown, Virginia is where... Um, first Africans were said to have been brought against their will, 1619, according to some historians. And, you know, that's three years away. It's going to be 400 years from that time. You know, 400 years from from that time. How do you see, as a man who's been on the ground here for a long time doing work in Richmond, Virginia, how do you see the connection in terms of our ancestral memory, you know, and what's going on with just movements like how you're involved in the movement i know the youth are involved in all kind of movements i don't know if the black lives matter is, is really active down here but there's all kind of movements under different banners that speak to the same thing we're talking about the door is wide open for us to take control to, to be self-sustained i feel like there's a reawakening taking place and that people are acutely aware of how important it is to be unapologetically African. Mm. Like right now, it's like, I feel like people are speaking truth to power, you know, in ways that are like, you know, I'm documented, backed up by facts. I'm not angry about it. I'm not, you know, belligerent about it. I'm just straight up and clear. Like these are the facts. You know, this is what makes logical sense as far as what needs to happen for African people. We need ownership of land. Mm. We need ownership of business. We need ownership of means of production. You know, we need control of our communities. Mm -hmm. And so there's a quiet work that's happening where people are taking that control back. And then the system is having to respond to that, you know, in, in variant ways. You yeah. know what I mean? And so the ways that it's responding to the work that we're doing is like it's making room mm -hmm. for that. Because we're like, you know, 
the combat for us is for the consciousness of the people. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Like, I don't even battling with the system. I'm battling for the war of our minds. Mm-hmm. And so I feel like right now, as people come to grips with the grasping of their consciousness back, then the means of production and all those different types of things come back into our into our hands. Um, the urban farming conversation being such a lightning rod space is very divine because we were brought here for agricultural purposes. Mm-hmm. And so for us to reclaim, for us to find our liberation back through the land mm-hmm. where we found ourselves oppressed mm-hmm. through individuals who stole the land, mm-hmm. I think it's a, the metaphor behind that is like, you know, you're going in, you're getting out the way you came in. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And I think that when we when we when we reconnect to the to the earth, you know, in that in a in a in a realistic industrial way, mm-hmm. you know, it syncs up so many other things because that's housing, you know, that's health, you know, that's that's wealth, you know, that's uh, public safety, mm-hmm. you know, all these things that we talk about, you know, the land is 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 you know, the core root of it, you right. know? And I think that everybody can concur that we don't have enough land to do what we need to do with. So, I mean, 2019, I mean, now 2016, you know, there is an awakening taking place. The Black Lives Matter is big here, just like it's big everywhere. But what's unique here is that it's big in circles of influence, mm. as in the academic circles. You know, they're very, like, acutely trying to grapple with it, you know what I mean? And, they're grappling with it. Huh? They're grappling with it. Like, they try and figure out how to incorporate this type of stuff into the curriculum and try to get the kids understanding how to be culturally competent, how to... Because, you know, you got to think about social work, social social uh, sociology, social work, uh, health. We're riding past Virginia Commonwealth University Medical College in Virginia. Like these people make so much money off of working in our community, mm-hmm. you know. So they try to figure out how do I connect to the community in a sustainable way. Mm-hmm. And so you know, there's well-meaning, well-intentioned, you know, uh, influencers that are seeing the Black Lives Matter as an opportunity to educate themselves and be more, you know, uh, uh, affirming of these very, very voices. See. Yeah, we pull it up on the on the on the burial ground now. But I want to ask you one last question. Um, you know, they say the more things change, the more they stay the same. You can pull it up. The more things change, the more they stay the same. And uh, you mentioned how our ancestors were brought here because of our skill um, working the land, and were used to to to, to enrich the the economy. You know. Virginia, Richmond especially is a weird place because it used to be the capital of the South, and at the same time, it's right there by the North. You know, you know, for our generation, you know, one of the biggest misconceptions was that uh, the, you know, the South was these submissive and docile kind of Africans, which we know that ain't the case, and the North was just the hardcore, you know, ragamuffin, you know, militant youth. But I'm wondering, because I know what we see in Atlanta, as we are talking about the open doors and the opportunities, what are some of the hazards that you've seen in this very same movement, um, you know, in terms of a neo-colonialism again, you know, in terms of a, a new grab for the land? Um, the gentrification is being... Uh uh, carried out to colonize African minds. <laughs> so you got blacks or people of color mm-hmm. who basically given free reign to, you know, other ethnicities to mm. come into our community and take ownership. Mm. So that's a challenge. It's a major challenge because it's like, okay, they're not, they're not talking about ownership. They're talking about, you know, how our community can be serviced. Right. And I don't really respect us always being on the receipt of services, mm. you know, because it keeps us dependent. Right. But um, there's a certain class of, 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 of African person in this in this region that's perfectly cool with, you know, keeping the status quo to a certain degree because they feel like the white folks can do it better than we can. Mm. You know what I mean? 
and um, they don't have faith in 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 in, in the liber in the liberation theology mm. that's 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 attached to us taking back the land. They don't have faith in us speaking truth to power. They feel afraid. I was told once that um, even though I'm proficient and I have the expertise and the skill level and I have the documented successes, mm. that you know I was too militant. Like, I, I ain't, I'm not on the protest line. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I'll go to war with ideas. And, you know, the work speaks for itself. It's like, oh, we don't want to give him the money because he's a little bit too. He might scare some folks. Mm-hmm. I say, well, you know, ironically, the folks that you think that I'm scaring actually want to fund, you know, the works because they know that at the end of the day, in order for it to be sustainable, that we got to own it and we got to control it. So, Ah, them people are inconsequential because they are unsustainable. Yeah, they're par for the course. Yeah. They they, just, you gotta love how you put that. They're unsustainable. That's real. <laughs> they're unsustainable. Uh, well, yeah. Universally speaking, mm-hmm. white supremacy is unsustainable. Oh, and a lot of people find that hard to believe, don't want to listen to that because they it's been sustained for such a long time and done such a job mm-hmm. on our minds where we see the table turning out. Yeah. But a manifest, give thanks, man. So uh, I know. I know that uh, Happily Natural Day is coming up, not to really date this, but it's coming up. We in Black August. Yes, so it is what it is. Give people the website where they can get more information Happy and follow you with just the work. Is the bomb. You go to happilynaturalday.com. There's a lot of information there um, for consciousness, raising purposes, urban farming purposes. Um, it's a plethora of articles and videos on all that stuff that me and brothers like Ross Kofi talk about all the time. Um, so the festival is every summer uh, dedicated to holistic health and wellness, culture, awareness, and social change. Um, it's about loving yourself, sure. you know, and being in tune with your identity, you know, and detoxing from this Western-dominated white supremacist ideology, mm-hmm. you know, letting it go. It's, it's okay to let it go. Sure. It'll be fine. <laughs> we'll be fine. We were doing generation after generation, century after century without it. True. And we'll be good. That's it. What's up? Peace.